Come get your fill of the new Space Marine rules for 8th edition 40k. Spiking bits. What's up Hobby Maniacs, Rob Bear with you again today, checking out the brand spanking new Index Imperium 1 for all the Space Marines, all the flavors of Space Marines right here. It's like Skittles with Space Marines. <laughs> so this is the big 220 page book, this is the one and only, the big one everybody's going to be gobbling up and trying to figure out if everything works the same as it used to in 7th edition and long story short not necessarily I suppose uh, there's still some really good mechanics in here and a lot of those units you know such as dreadnoughts or even predator uh, annihilator tanks or predator regular tanks for that matter are uh, gonna actually have an impact on the tabletop now which is uh, really cool to see because uh, you know I can't I can't tell you how many random terminators and tanks I have gathering dust on my shelves personally and it's really cool to have this opportunity to uh, you know bring them out and play with them not everything's just all a gill man uh, these days right so the couple a couple things you need to know right off the bat is your data sheets are gonna be in the front well special special rules and everything and abilities that may or may not confer to each data sheet are going to be in the front of each section here and then inside the sections they're going to tell you basically how the stuff comes armed and what you can sub out and then if you're playing a match play you get it to the back of the book here and that's going to tell you where you can well it's going to give you your weapon your overall weapon profiles but it's also maybe more importantly going to give you your points profiles like how much the units cost uh, sometimes things don't cost anything at all. It's all zero points, but a lot, of, a lot of times they do cost points between the ranged weapons and the melee weapons themselves, which you can pretty much equip everything like you used to do back in the day, and it's really cool. Oh, and another thing to keep in mind too is in the front of each section, there's specific combinations of war gear that things can take. So if they say, hey, you can choose from the melee weapons list, well, here's your options right here. Now, sometimes there's asterisks and there's certain things you can't, you know, no, little notations here that you need to be aware of. So always, always read the fine print, but we're gamers, we're pretty much used to that, right? So here's the overall contents of the book. Like you said, 240 some pages overall. Uh, you're gonna have your regular Space Marines, your blue flavored Space Marines, <laughs> your yellow flavored Space Marines, your red and blue flavored Space Marines, your black Space Marines, your, your other black Space Marines, your green Space Marines, and your white Space Marines, and then your Space Marines that are on fire. And then it goes into all the other ones that have individual books. So this is all the stuff that was traditionally in your normal codex books, your normal Space Marine codex books. And then of course, Blood Angels are gonna have their own set of rules. Uh, Flesh Terrors don't really, not yet. Dark Angels, Space Wolves, Death Watch, Grey Knights, and then your generic like uh, appendices and things back here that tell you how to bring it all together that we just covered there. So on to the rules themselves, because I think overall, if you play Space Marines, you're definitely gonna scoop this book up, right? Well, who, who are we kidding at this point? So how do they work? Well, a couple of quick caveats uh, that you need to be aware of, of course, and this really comes into play, uh, I guess, probably more on the Imperial side than the Chaos and the Xeno side. So when you're thinking about building your armies, you need to remember two quick things out of the rule book here, at least if you're playing a match play. First off, your army faction, you must have all of the same faction in your match play army, okay? This is on page 214, and that gets into you know, choosing missions and things like that. But what you need to know is, so if you're playing an Imperium army, which you would be for Space Marines, Obviously, everything in here has to have keyword Imperium. And then you kick it over to uh, the rules for Battleforged armies, and a Battleforged army has to consist of detachments. And each detachment has a specific battlefield role, which we, we should all be used to. There's two new ones now, of course. You got Flyer and uh, the uh, Elite, or excuse me, Flyer and Dedicated Transport slots now. But in and of itself, inside of each detachment, there's restrictions, and for the most part, the restrictions are all units must have, have to be from the same faction, except for right now, the only exception for that is Gene Stealer Call. So keeping that stuff in mind, that is basically the, the kind of the crux of the matter of how you make these armies. So getting in here to your specific chapters, now there's, uh, there's an additional layer of complexity because you're gonna take some guys, like say for instance, you're gonna take a captain here, which overall, uh, they all pretty much have the rights of battle ability, which you can reroll rolls of one made for friendly chapter units within six inches of this model. So you can sub in, you can say Ultramarines, you can say Dark Angels, you can say whatever you want there, uh, for the most part, as long as this unit is allowed in one of those chapter armies in and of itself to have specific rules like dark angels will have a list of things they can take blood angels will have a, a list of things they can take so on and so forth which we're going to cover here in a minute but that being said remember that this only applies to say you take ultramarines that's only going to apply 
to other ultramarine units. So that's your basis of how, because the only reason I'm really breaking this down, you're probably like, Rob, I've been reading these, all these rumors and everything for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. I know how this works. I'm like a professional at 8th edition. But, you know, this, the, the books aren't even out yet. Why are you explaining this to me? Well, back in the day, we used to have what was called Super Friends. And we had, a, or even Gladius for that matter, that mixed, a, mixed and matched a lot of different units from a lot of different books in kind of a way that really isn't possible these days. So I'm just making sure that we all kind of start off on the right foot and kind of move forward and not making some of the mistakes that we made perhaps back in 7th edition. So that's kind of how you need to make your armies, okay? So that being said, uh, all chapters are going to have their, their chapter keyword, which abilities will affect other units inside that particular chapter. You know, like uh, people like Gilman are uh, obviously going to only interact with Ultramarine armies, right? Abilities. They shall know no fear. Pretty much every model has this in the Space Marine book. It's the ability to reroll failed morale tests for this unit, which, uh, taken at face value, doesn't seem like a lot, but once you start really digging in and realize how critical morale is to the new 8th edition, it's super important. Like, this is an amazing ability because they have such high leadership. So, in the eventuality that you do, uh, fail a test and start losing models, maybe even multi-wound models, that's a, that's a huge kick in the pants. So the, the ability to reroll it is pretty good. Now, get into Libraries, we're only restricted to three powers currently. I say currently because Games Workshop has said that there will be future books and additions and uh, additions and replacements for uh, pretty much all of the Codex books. They said codexes were dead, but we don't know what that means, but they did say new rules would be coming out for all this stuff. So, I don't know, read between the lines there. But for, <laughs> I think we can all agree that there used to be way more psychic powers than just these three right here. But these three are pretty good ones. Veil of Time, Might of Heroes, and Null Zone. And of course, you can just pick from the chart a la carte if you want, or you can roll it up. Don't know what the you know uh, professional tournament series are gonna adopt as as rules for all this. You know, like hey, um, you know, if you're playing on the the, the pro circuit or whatever you want to call it, I, I, I guess I'm assuming it's just gonna be ITC. That you know you you have to roll. I don't know. I don't know what it's gonna be. But for right now, according to the rules as written in match play, boom, you get to choose. So let's take a look at it. Veil of Time. Until the start of your next psychic phase, you can reroll all charge rolls and advance rolls for that unit, and they always have to fight first in the fight phase, even if they didn't charge, which is huge, because that's the whole advantage to charging, is that you get to activate first, and then your opponent has to use command points to activate a stratagem to try to interrupt your sequence at least once, so they get in with their elite units and hopefully do some damage and stand the tide or uh, stop the hemorrhaging just a bit from a huge line of stuff coming in. However, this uh, gives you that ability right off the bat. If an enemy also has units that have charged or have a similar ability, which I guess the one that comes to mind right now would be uh, Celeste has that uh, innate ability right off the bat, then the enemy has uh, uh, then alternate choosing units to fight with, starting with the player whose turn it is taking place. So whoever's player it is, remember turns are based by player now, the battle phase is what we used to consider the turn overall. So each player has their own player turn in a battle phase, which like I said, the previous turn. Might of Heroes, uh, any model within 12 inches of Psyker until the end of your next Psychic phase, add one to that model's strength, toughness, and attack characteristics, which again, in the past, was kind of a cantrip. It kind of didn't matter. It's like one of those things that's like, eh, that's kind of cool if I don't have anything else you know, going on, I might come back to that spell. But now, in eighth edition, that's pretty strong because having plus one strength in a lot of cases might take you from a three to wound to a two to wound or perhaps from a four to wound to a three to wound which can be pretty huge the extra 13 to 15 percent depending on how you round the uh, a fraction on a d6 <laughs> can really kind of turn it uh, really come into play in in itself here in the new edition and then null zone it's warp charge at eight so it's a little bit tougher to get off however uh, when manifested until the start of your next psychic phase while they are within six inches of a Psyker, enemy models cannot take invulnerable saves and must half the result of any Psychic test rounding up that they take. Now that's pretty crucial because, you know, the max on a Psychic test in most, in most cases is a 12. Having it down to a six, that you have to roll maximum just to get off a below average casting spell, which is kind of crazy. That is a huge, and that's why it only has a six inch, remember six inch diameter, excuse me, six inch radius, that equals out to a six inch diameter or excuse me, a 12 inch diameter. I can almost do math today. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is 12 inches is a lot of space on the tabletop. So <laughs> be aware of this here because people like, you know, all of your cycles and, and Tigarius actually is no, is no chump in this edition either. He's actually pretty good. He's not the powerhouse he used to be, but there really isn't a whole lot in this game that, that really seems to be. It's all, everything kind of works together in layers.
Now for the generic Space Marines, we've kind of seen how they are intended to work. Again, they work in layers, kind of your combined arms. I'm gonna say combined arms a lot because it was a term I threw around before we even got to seventh edition. My personal armies, I would like to have some heavy supports. I would like to have fast attack. I would like to have a, a, core, a good core of troops in there. And that's what I call combined arms. You know, going drawing from my military background and my military knowledge, that is what it is called. And I haven't, I never stopped doing that in all, the, all my lists I played for the most part. And, you know, it, I think it's just a superior way to build your list, air quotes, combined arms, not the term that you would expect from the game, but just an overall military, military term in and of itself. And that kind of seems to be um, just a generic term to say the stuff synergizes well together. That's, I, I guess that would be a better term because it doesn't confuse a, uh, a game term of a previous edition with me trying to explain a new edition. So we'll say um, synergize, right? So. A lot of these units are designed to synergize well with each other. And that's, we just talked about rights of battle. Rerolling hits of ones is basically a faux preferred enemy. We all know how effective that is from the last edition. Rerolling ones makes you, you know, if you hit on threes, you basically kind of hit on twos, depending on how you want to do the math. But it is a noticeable bump in your probabilities there, right? Then you've got stuff like jump pack assault, and that's where you can kind of, you know, come in from out of the blue, you can land, but you cannot uh, you cannot move anymore. But however, you can still launch assaults, and that's what um, veil time actually comes into play here. Because reroll and charge rolls and advance rolls for a unit, uh, and then allowing them uh, to always fight first is is pretty huge. It's it's almost. It's almost semi-broken in this format. I mean, it's not broken, but it can be really utilized in a kind of like a scalpel-like format or fashion by a very tactful general to um, a lot, to basically get stuff in. And let me put it to you this way, and if we haven't drilled this, this point home, and I'm spending a lot of time on this because this is a great foundation to kind of build from, to give you ideas for any of these Marine armies in here, is if, if you have a nine, if you come in and you're more than nine inches away from an enemy, right? We all know that the average roll on 2d6 is uh, is 7, okay? So you're going to be, that's a long charge distance, but now with the Phantom Inch, you only have to get within 1 inch. It kind of negates the whole more than 9 inches away. And the fact that you have command points now, and you can re-roll one of those dice, and say you roll say you roll dice and you get you get a 2 and a 5, right? And that's your, that's your charge. Well, you know that's 7, which it is probability that you, more times than not, might get a 2 or a 5. I'm gonna reroll that too, and I'm gonna I'm going I'm going for broke. I'm going for a four. I'm just going for average at that point with my command point. Now, however, if I'm allowed to just arbitrarily reroll that because of veil of time, I think that's uh, pretty huge right off the bat, right? Now, that means so let's look at one thing right here. Until the start of your next psychic phase, you can reroll for that unit. Okay, so this wouldn't necessarily work on something that came in from reserves. But it would work on something that's going across the table because remember, Space Marines aren't necessarily the most mobile kind of units. But that being said, let's just shelve that whole that whole kind of uh, concept for a second because, like I said, you can't arrive from reserve and then cast because you you already had. Um, actually, when is the psychic phase? Oh shoot! Yeah, you actually could. Well, it depends on the mechanic of when you arrive. If you arrive at the end of the movement phase, I guess theoretically you could still do this because that's the whole thing. So, okay, theoretically, both points are still about, are still about. But what I'm trying to say is, whether or not you have the Vill of Time, you still have command points to re-roll. And re-roll, having the ability to see the, what those two dice are, and obviously, if you roll a two or a three, you're kind of going to be like, hmm, am I going to spend a command point to re-roll one of these dice to try to, because uh, at that point, what do you need? On a three, you need a six. That's the only result you need to make this, to make this assault happen. On a two, or so you get two twos, you're not even going to try it. So you have the ability to kind of hedge your bets there, whether you're even going to attempt the reroll in the first place. But with Veil of Time, it kind of makes it, uh, you know, even even sweeter right off the bat. Let me check out. Uh, yeah, so psychic phase is after movement phase. That's what I suspected. So theoretically, both points are correct. So that kind of gives you the idea that a nine inch charge, more than nine inches is away, isn't as far as it seems. And please try to remember that because between um, having the command points uh, to reroll and that veil of time psychic power for space marines. These guys can really come in and do the Lord's work or the Emperor's work, however you want to look at it. Now, it's going through, there's a whole bunch of stats and things like that in here. And a lot of things are going to be very familiar to what we've seen in the past. And, you know, some stuff's going to be work a little different than like, um, you know, Terminators, for instance, are uh, two wounds now. Stuff like Dreadnoughts, they're going to clock in around that toughness seven, that eight wound kind of uh, area right there that we've seen in the past. 
Um, you know, we did some battle reports just kind of trying that out last summer and just, hey, this would be a good idea if Dreadnoughts went to that. And it turns out they, they actually went to that. And that was, uh, that was pretty cool to see. Like some of the lower armor stuff, like speeders, are going to be around your kind of toughness six kind of uh, area there. Stuff like uh, Storm Towns are going to have lower wounds where speeders or higher wounds, speeders are going to have lower wounds. Just to kind of give you an idea how all that works. Now, drop pods only are um, allowed to embark chapter infantry on them. You can no longer put uh, terminators on them, or excuse me, dreadnoughts. You, can, you cannot also transport jump packs, terminator, primaris, or centurion models. So we know, or excuse me, terminators, comma, primaris. So we know that there will be, you know, they're going to want people to, to use the uh, uh, teleportation thing with the terminators, the primaris, space marines. I'm not even sure how you transport those at this point. I guess they're going to get their own tanks. Centurions were always kind of restricted, but not from drop pods. Now they are. And Dreadnoughts, I don't even know. I guess they're walking across the table or you're putting them in a Storm Raven until we see the rules. Now the Lucius Pattern Storm, um, Lucius Pattern Drop Pod is in the contents for the Forge World book here somewhere. I remember seeing it. So yep, there it is, Lucius Pattern Dreadnought Drop Pod. So I assume you will be able to, de to deep strike those in using the Drop Pod, but we won't see that book until uh, well after the release date of 8th edition because that's coming out from Forge Roll and getting shipped out to everybody. So that's how your uh, generic Space Marines kind of are working at this point. Like we all know LAS cannons are effective. We all kind of know how Melta guns are working nowadays. Now, we get into the first faction, and of course, you know, we got Gilliman, and Gilliman's a true, he's a true pimp, and you're going to want to take this guy if you're playing Ultramarines. He, he, you know, you can play uh, an Imperium army, however, his benefits are really only for the Ultramarines. Oh, excuse me, they are for Imperium. I thought they were Ultramarines. Oh, no, that's this one. Okay, so yes, you can add one to advance and charge rolls for any friendly Imperium within 12, and reroll hits a 1 and fail morale. But as the Primarch of the 13th Legion, you can reroll any fail to hit and wound rolls for any friendly Ultramarine army within six or rebuild in Gilman. So that kind of gives you an idea there. He's good in both types of armies, and I don't see if you have the points for him, I don't see why you wouldn't put him in either of the armies right there, unless of course you know you're playing um, a specific Adeptus Astartes faction and you just uh, you, you, you you just hate the, you hate the blue guys. I don't know what to say there. <laughs> he seems pretty good to me. And then it goes into uh, the rest of the Ultramarine special characters. Of course, you got Tigarius, and he he's pretty good still. Uh, subtracting rolls of one to hit from attacks to target Chief Librarian Tigarius. He can manifest two psychic powers in each friendly psychic uh, psychic phase. He also knows smite and knows three powers from the Librarius discipline. LOL, all of them, because <laughs> there's only three. How about that? Now, they may change that at some point, and you'll just get to pick out the three you want. But for right now, he knows pretty much every psychic power out there. Pretty cool. Uh, he can also add one to deny the witch tests against enemy psychers within 12, and can reroll failed psychic tests, as we saw in the past. And his weapons aren't too shabby either. The Rod of Tigarius is plus three strength, neg one AP, and D3 damage. So, uh, not a cream puff force weapon at all right there. Pretty cool. Now jumping into the rest of oh and the Terminus Ultra is in here. I didn't I did not see that yet. That's cool. That's that land raider with the, all the last cannons, which uh, you might be needing these days because man, let me tell you what, there is so much stuff with a ridiculous amount of wounds out there. Last cannons do the Lord's work for sure. Then it gets into the fists, uh, the Imperial Fist, the Crimson Fist, the Raven Guard, all the special characters out there, and of course you can field them in either Adeptus Stardis, Imperium Army, or Salamander Army. Uh, that you want but remember there is the faction restriction and I guess I should have brought that up when I talked about the rhinos but there is the faction restriction on the rhino it says you have to be of the same faction as the rest of the army to even get into the rhino wherever the rhino is rhino where are you probably in the dedicated transport section here we go so a model where is it Um, regain, oh, it's still got its repair mechanism. Uh, vehicles blow up on a roll of six within D3. Okay, so faction keywords is chapter. Oh, okay, there it is. Uh, model, this model can transport 10 chapter infantry models. So you're not gonna have your Imperium guys or your uh, Astro Militarum dudes running into the Rhino and then taking off. So if you buy something for Ultramarine chapter, well, they pretty much is only for Ultramarine chapters. Um, and then there's the additional restrictions right there. And it's a lot of um, very similar things 
for, let's see, like Razorbacks say the same thing, chapter infantry, drop pods say chapter infantry. So you just gotta be aware, based on the stuff we talked about at the beginning of the video, how exactly all of that works in relation to each other. So chances are, if you wanna play like White Scars, you wanna play Salamanders, you're gonna want your whole detachment to be of the same faction or the same chapter keyword so then that way they can all benefit from each other's transport but then again there's other ways around it and maybe that's not your jam and that's okay too but i'm just giving you the information as we know and then there's an entry for legion of the damned and you can't just take the legion of the damned keyword and throw it around willy-nilly there's specific restrictions on that too all right so the very first set of rules for an alternate chapter which used to previously have its own set of rules of course was the blood angels there and for these alternate chapters there's a list of what they are allowed to take with their chapter keyword and surprise surprise they can't take things like you know centurions or um what was the other thing that blood angels always wanted that could never get mm, thunderfire maybe i think yeah thunderfire they can't take centurions so there's a few things there that they still don't have access to, but Gilmain, in his infinite wisdom, has blessed them with the ability to take the Primaris Marines. So that was very nice of him. <laughs> I'm sure him and Dante had a really interesting conversation about, oh, here's the Primaris Marines. Oh, cool. Well, do I get the, uh, um, you know, Centurions? Nah, you can't get Centurions, but you get these Primus Marines. All right, thanks, dog. Super appreciate it. <laughs> so special ability for the Blood Angels. You may reroll failed morale tests for this unit. Black Rage adds one to this unit's attack characteristic in the fight phase. If it charged in the preceding charge phase, in addition, roll D6 each time this unit loses a wound. On a roll of six, the damage is ignored. That's that foe, uh, feel no pain. And jump pack assault. We've seen that in the past. You know, you can set them up in reserve and then they can drop in uh, more than nine inches away from any models. We talked about that at the beginning. Sanguinary Discipline, Blood Boil, Shield of Sanguinius, and Unleash Rage, which again, in the past, were all kind of eh, cool powers. Not exactly sure I would take them, but if I have something to, something to do that's very specialized, I would take them, but nowadays, let's check it out. Blood Boil, uh, select a visible enemy unit within 18 of the Psyker and roll three dice. The target suffers a mortal wound for each result that equals or exceeds its toughness value. So great against stuff of toughness three or less, Hmm, four, okay, five and six, probably not gonna waste my time with it. Shield of Sanguinius, select a friendly Blood Angels unit within 12. Until the start of your next Psyche phase, that unit has a four up and vulnerable save. I feel like that is really, really, really good because they just don't hand out four, four up and vulnerable saves anymore. And being able to throw down a whole squad, well, that could be a game changer, just as long as it's Blood Angels, right? Unleash Rage, select a friendly Blood Angels unit within 12. Until the start of your next Psychic phase, that unit has plus one attack. Huh, I feel like that's a reoccurring thing with the Blood Angels. They like to attack things. They like to attack things fast. They like to attack things with a lot of attacks. And they get a little bit of feel no pain, which is pretty cool. So, jumping into the rules themselves, you've got your special characters that we all come to know and love, including Sanguinary Priest with the options to be on bike. Also, a jump pack. Brother Corbulu, which I think is all seeing eye, or is far, far seeing eye. Once per turn, you can reroll a single die roll made with Brother Corbulu. I feel like that's pretty good as well. And the Narthesium now has that really interesting terminology that I think it says if the unit contains a wounded model, it may regain D3 lost wounds. On a four up, a single slain model is returned to the unit with one wound remaining. So I think that's pretty good. Uh, I feel like he might be an auto include at this point uh, in most lists there. And his Heaven's Teeth melee weapon isn't too shabby either plus one strength neg one ap right there and he can always chuck a crack grenade uh if he so desires so yeah not too bad i haven't checked his points value yet but definitely going to take a closer look at him death company i think we all know he has that black rage special rule which i actually assumed it was them but it is not oh yeah it is there it is cool right there Do their normal troops have it i seriously doubt they would i don't even think they have normal troops do they no, because you just pull them out of the, uh, you just pull them out of the, their normal tactical squads you pull out of, yeah, you probably just pull them out of that list there, so that makes sense. So not everybody's going to get Black Rage, of course, which makes 100% complete sense. Yep, tactical squad, you just pull out of there. So it's not going to have any blanket rules yet until they get their own book. And there's Gabriel Seth. Um, I'm not exactly sure how this works, but it seems like the Blood Angel special rules don't really interact well if you want to be flesh sharers, so, mmm. Kind of on the fence on that one. Dark Angels, next 
specialized faction up here. Of course, they have a slew of special abilities. Here's their a la carte menu of what they are allowed to choose from. It looks like they also have been paid a visit by a Christmas Gilman and given the new Primaris Space Marines. So, their special rules are Unforgiven. A unit automatically passes morale tests. In addition, you can reroll failed to hit rolls in the fight phase for this unit if it is targeting a fallen unit, which I imagine won't happen very often. So, um, probably just get to pass morale checks anyways, automatically, if they have that special ability, which I imagine it is just models from the first company or the inner circle. Jink, if this unit advances, it gains a five up vulnerable saving and sells shooting attacks until the start of your next movement phase. Hey, Jink's back, but not exactly Mm, it's given out to everybody, but I imagine some bikes have that one there. Enteromancy Discipline, of course. Uh, Mindworm was always good, but never good enough that, oh my MG, I need it. But this time around, it's pretty decent. Uh, it's a warp charge value of 6. Uh, select an enemy unit within 12. This unit suffers a mortal wound and may only be chosen to attack in a fight phase after all other eligible units have made their attacks effect last until the end of your turn. So, a potentially crippling and a uh, paper cut, but more importantly, it makes them activate last and assault. So that can be pretty huge for a lot of things out there. Aversion, uh, War Charge 6, select an enemy unit within 24 until your next second phase, your opponent must subtract one from all hit rolls made for that unit. Obviously target, target the good stuff with that one. Engulfing Fear, if manifested, your opponent must roll two dice and discard the lowest result when taking morale chances for any unit that was in six of the Psyker in the morale phase. Pretty cool. I think those are all very cool stuff and probably worth taking there. So there's our chapter specific guys that aren't on the a la carte list. You got Azrael, Belial, uh, some Chaplin, some Chaplains. You got Samion, Corvex, of course, or Sableclaw, whichever you prefer. More Chaplains, the Chaplain of Chaplains, Asmodai, and Ezekiel. Then you got your Deathwing Apothecary, your Ancient, all sorts of things that we have come to know and expect out of these guys and it looks like yep as suspected the bikes have jink how about that <laughs> ravenwing bike squad they have jink yep they have jink pretty cool and the ravenwing dark talent which and the nephilim jet fighter which actually might be worth taking a more than a cursory look at now in this edition here Ooh, what's dark shroud do you as you can imagine i have not broken down all of these and we'll be doing them in future tips and tactics videos must subtract one for all hit rolls to make for shooting attacks from target friendly dark angels within six inches of this model. Mm, that's not bad. And because it is a speeder, you got your toughness six. It has a less wounds than, hmm, has less wounds than the storm talent, but it is just basically a big land speeder, so I, I suppose that makes sense. All right. Well, let's keep going here to the next unit or next army. Space wolves are next up here, and there's your a la carte list. Of course, they have they shall know no fear as well. And the ability to switch out some Dreadnought weapons, as we've seen in the past, you know, you can have stuff like the Great Wolf Cod or Plasma Cannon, things like that. Um, they are the first one to be able to do that. They can also take the Blizzard Shield and uh, the Frenesian, Frenesian Great Axe as well. Here's their choice of war gear, and of course they have the Tempestus Discipline that we saw in the last edition as well. That's going to be Stormcaller, Tempest Rass, and Jaws of the World Wolf. I might mean, have skipped an addition in effectiveness, but I think it's back this time around. Warp Charge 7, if manifested, pick an enemy unit within 18 of the Psyker, other than the vehicle, roll 2d6 and subtract the target's move characteristic. The target unit suffers a number of mortal wounds equal to the result. So I imagine in a lot of cases you're going to be targeting something with a 4 or 5 movement value. Average roll on 2d6 is a 7, so you're probably going to be popping off, you know, 2 to 3 mortal wounds right off the bat right there. It seems pretty good definitely worth taking stormcaller might be a little bit more effective uh, in the overall because any friendly space wolf unit within six of him not wholly within six just within six gain the benefits of being in cover which would be uh, plus one to their save there and then tempest wrath pick an enemy unit within 18 your opponent must subtract one from all hit rolls they make for that unit until the start of your next psychic phase so we're seeing a lot of mechanics here that let your faction Space Marine re-roll their ones, sometimes a little better depending on what the ability of the captain is. We've got a lot of psychic powers that augment you know, morale and also allow you to kind of lock down enemy units or one specific unit from you know neg one to their hit, but also some things that give you cover, which is pretty cool. And that's kind of what we've seen throughout the years psychic power wise, but they were never incredibly effective 
as they are now in 8th edition. At least a cursory look and not having played a whole lot of games quite yet. And then all of your faction specific guys are all in here and they're back. Can't tell you how effective Logan Grimnar is, haven't read up on it yet, but like I said, tips and tactics videos are definitely on the way for sure. Uh, Y'all, Stormcaller, you can add one to any psychic test you make. Hmm, that's pretty cool. And of course, Psychic Hood has changed. Now it's uh, you get plus one to deny the witch against any enemy within 12 inches. And of course, uh, Tigarius has a little extra ability there. Ulrich's in here, so lots and lots of stuff. They have all sorts of options. Now, if you're kind of, um, you know, if you played your Space Wolves the old way, where you took a lot of hero models and things, a lot of elites, you know, off the Champions at Fenris book, you still can do that theoretically based on the attachments in here. You could take like the, what is it, the Vanguard attachment. Yeah, the Vanguard attachment has a ton of elites in here. You technically don't have to take troops. I mean, you can take whatever you want uh, based off these 12 detachments in here, which are really cool. Um, but sometimes you maybe don't want troops. Maybe you want, you know, a bunch of Wolfguard battle leaders or whatever. Well, there's ways for you to do it. You can even go down here and just take the exaulor, exaulor, uh, auxiliary. And, but it's going to give you negative one to your command point. So however you want to make your armies, there's a good way to do it, supposedly, but you just want to watch your command points because command points are definitely worth having in this edition. Now, on to yet another special marine army here. We've got the Death Watch. And the Death Watch, kind of a recent addition to the Adeptus Astartes. We saw them come out relatively towards the end of 7th edition, of course. And you kind of know how they work by now because they are so recent. Uh, and chances are, unless you're just a completely new player to the game of 8th edition, then you might not be as familiar with them as some other folks. But there's just a lot of um, overlapping, I guess, special rules and the ability to equip them different ways and put different things in armies. Now, it's kind of still the case here. Like, they still have their special issue ammunition, which you can see right here, the traditional stuff, dragon fire, plus one of your hits, hellfire rounds, um, weapon always wounds on a two up, crack and bolt, add three inches to the range or six inches otherwise, and improve the AP of the attack by one, which is pretty crucial these days. I love extra AP on all my weapons. Vengeance rounds, subtract three inches from the range of this weapon if it is a bolt pistol or six inches and improve the AP by two. So uh, that's, the, you know, Vengeance was always your marine killer round uh, and Kraken was kind of your, um, uh, kind of your, I guess this was more for kind of long range stuff. Dragonfire was your, um, no, excuse me, Hellfire round was more your anti-beast kind of type thing, but they're all in there in uh, their one form or another right there. Here's your a la carte menu of what you're allowed to choose from, from the normal generic stuff up front of the book now. And then each one where they say, hey, you can take, because they're, they're so specialized in what they do, there's a specific war gear list right here and then a normal war gear list too. So it's a little convoluted on how you take it, but once you kind of start boiling it down, it becomes a little bit easier, right? And the Death Watch kill team has a ton of special rules. So, Definitely read up on all this stuff. I'm not too familiar with it. I haven't started breaking down all the factions and all the data sheets again, but uh, it seems like at cursory look they do very similar to what they did in the past. Um, so you got all these guys in here: Terminators, Death Watch veterans, Corvus Black Star, which is always super good, Death Watch bikers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then it kicks over to the Grey Knights, which we all know they've been around for a while, so a lot of people are familiar with them. Here's your a la carte menu. They can do the teleport strike if they want. That's where you set up uh, the units with a special rule uh, all in reserve. And then at any point in your movement phase, you can be like, boop, we're here. Set it up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than nine inches away. It's just kind of an alternate to the jump, jump pack strike. You know, the Tau have their manta ray drop thing. You know, it's every, everything. Is, it's trying to be more flavorful is, uh, with, uh, you know, the overall narrative of the game, which I think is pretty cool. They also have right of banishment, which changes the smite psyche power a little bit. Uh, it now has a range of 12 instead of 18. Additionally, the target suffers only one mortal wound rather than D3 if it doesn't have the demon special rule. If it has the, de or the demon keyword, if it has a demon keyword, then they suffer three mortal wounds instead. So it's a little give and take right there, but remember these guys are the Order of Malleants. They are the demon hunters, basically. They're specialized to kill the demon. But being Space Marines and having access to all those weapons, well, they're pretty good at killing Space Marines too, so there you go. <laughs> uh, they have the they, they shall know under field rule and um, this stuff for psych psychers having the banishment special rule right there. The Santic Discipline, which we've seen in the past, um, 
nothing new here. Purge Soul, Gate of Infinity, Hammer Hands. I bet you can guess what these do, but let's break it down real quick. Purge Soul. Pick an invisible enemy unit within 12 of the Psyker, both controlling player roll of dice and add their respective unit's highest leadership value. If the target's total is higher or or equal to or greater than the Psyker's total, nothing happens. If the Psyker's total is greater to the target's total, that's you casting the power, then the target unit suffers a number of mortal wounds equal to the difference. So if they beat or exceed it, they fend off your attack. But if you uh, beat their total you do the number of more wounds so could be good could be bad it's situational but it's something you know for a psyker a lot that's allowed to have multiples of these powers it's situational so you're only going to use it when it's going to be effective right gate of affinity uh you know fan favorite right there pick a friendly gray knight unit within 12 the psyker remove that unit from the battlefield oh we got a we got the warhammer cat up here get out of here you silly she always hears me talking and wants to be part of the show don't you yeah no oh, i know i know We'll finish up here. We'll go play. All right, Gate of Affinity. So uh, the big drawback with Gate of Affinity in the past was, you know, you would scatter. And you could scatter on the enemy, and that's no good um, because you're already on the table, and it kind of seems uh, really pointless for you losing your models that you're already on the table, right? It kind of seems, uh, almost seems unfair, I suppose. But now you just basically get to pick them up and set them back down, similar, for uh, you know, fashion to the Orc Special or the Orc Psyche Power. So more than nine inches away, good to go right there, and they can still launch an assault. And hammer hands, if manifested, pick a granite unit within 12 of the Psyker, add one to wound rolls you make for that unit's melee weapons until the start of your next Psychic phase. So it isn't a plus two, but a plus one is good enough in my book too. Uh, all of these things are really great. And of course, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Lord Kaldor Drago makes his triumphant return. He's, um, He's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> hitting on twos, I hear is good. Uh, uh, you know, it used to be only one unit in the game could hit on twos, but now a lot of these specialized uh, combat blenders are definitely hitting on twos. Now he does have five attacks, which uh, is is decent. Is decent. Um, but the Titan Sword plus four strength, neg four AP, does three damage per. So I feel like he's going to be doing some damage right there. All the other normal weapons on par with what we've seen in the past. So he is going to be up at strength 8 when he's swinging the mighty, mighty Titan Sword right there. Um, warp Emergence. During deployment, you can set up Lord Kaldor Drago in the warp instead of placing him on the battlefield. And they can emerge anywhere on the battlefield as more than 9 inches away. So the whole narrative thing right there, he doesn't have the teleport attack. He has the Warp Emergence because remember, he's just wandering around and popping out from time to time. Uh, that's his whole narrative right there. So pretty good, pretty good. I like him. Uh, then we got Grandmaster of all this recently part of one of the triumvirates that came out, and all the other guys right there. Stern still has his uh, Strands of Fate special rule where he gets the rerolls, but he gives your opponent rerolls too. It can be a little fluffy depending on how you look at it. And that kind of rounds out all of our units here, or all of the special Astartes there, and then you got all the points values and things like that that we talked about already. So there it is. We made it full circle. Codex Imperium 1. We have all five of the books under our belt now. Now it's time to go back, nug out all those tips and tactics on each and every faction in here, tell you what you need to know about each and every unit. Well, the majority of units, give you some ideas for army lists, talk about points values, etc, etc. Those will be coming up in the coming weeks because this is a lot of material to uh, read and digest. Uh, as we get to it because like I said all the rules coming out all at once is pretty crazy and almost unprecedented We kind of saw it at third edition, but not uh, As you can imagine there has been a lot more units added to the game in the past 15 years or so So there it is. We're doing the best we can here. Thank you for watching all of our videos Make sure you subscribe to us and turn notifications on so you can be the first to like and comment on our videos here. And head on over to longwar.net. That's the home of the battle reports for exclusive content, early access videos, and more. Become a veteran of the long war today.